Okay, can you see me? I can see you. Very good, how are you? I'm fine, so what about you? I'm a little bit anxious, what comes now? <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking a little bit about just, you know, the swing plane and face plane uh, feature in the professional report. And uh, I've prepared just a little bit of a PowerPoint for us to kind of go through and then we can field some questions at the end. Okay, that's perfect. I, I tried to prepare it a little bit by showing roughly how it looks like in our reporting, but I think you can really explain in depth the significance of this information because it's in the beginning, it seems to be a little bit theoretical information. Okay, what is swing plane? We might think, okay, it's all about get the putter squared impact and that's it. And this is what we teach. Um, but if it comes to, uh, okay, where are the problems coming from? And if you want to find out what we actually see with our students, uh, certainly we know it's more about the motion. And then the more we go into motion, the more we end up in, okay, there's some kind of structure behind, which is not easy to be detected with the naked eye. But you have worked on, on body motion before, so you're coming from this field. And so um, please give us your insights into this field of, of putting analysis. Yeah, sure, let's get started. Um... I'm gonna share my screen, is that okay? Absolutely. I will check if uh, everything comes up properly. Okay. Let's see. I'm screen sharing as it says. Okay, hang on one second. This is transferring from a PowerPoint to Keynote. So let's see how this thing looks. Okay. Let's see. How's that? Okay. Looks, well, yeah, it looks nice. Perfect. Very good. Okay. So today we're going to talk about swing plane, but actually we're going to be talking about three different planes. Um, so yeah, so it's very important for people to understand that swing plane is a big picture concept. Uh, this is a picture or an illustration that was provided by Golf Digest uh, in an article I had to publish for being uh, Golf Digest Top 50. And what's interesting is Golf Digest, when they first did this, they, they, they left out the circle. They thought I was talking about alignment. They thought I was talking about aim. And I said, no, we're aiming the circle. You got to have the circle on there. And they didn't understand what I was saying. I said, you got to have the swing plane on there. And they thought that the dotted line was parallel to the target. And they thought that I was just lining up square and that's not it at all. So if we take a look at this picture, we have the circle, the swing plane. And one of the dotted lines is the axis of rotation. Okay, so everybody take your finger like this and then you have a radius. So now we have an axis of rotation, a radius, and a plane. So that's what that picture represents. So you can see this golfer has a right to left putt. They have to aim the stroke or the circular motion to the right of the hole toward the aim point. So I think it'd be best for this presentation for people to, to start to look at the swing plane as a circle, even though it's represented on the report as a line. They're not plain lines, they're plain angles. So I'm gonna to go to the next present, uh, next slide. So I kind of <clears throat> created this so that when we go to look at the <clears throat> green, the swing plane would be the green circle or in the report, the green line. Um, the face plane would be the red circle or the red line in the report. And then the shaft plane would be the gray circle. So this is kind of the way I see it there's different planes of motion. And as we said, the mechanics, this is the mechanics of a circle. That's what people need to understand. Write this down. It's the mechanics of a circle or that of a wheel. So I liken the putting stroke to that of the mechanics of a wheel. So when we're talking about putting strokes, we're talking about the axis of rotation, which you can see right there in the blue dot that's in the middle of one of the circles the angle of that axis of rotation is key. 
because on a robot, I can change that axis of rotation around. But if I don't change the axis of rotation around, I'm going to always get the same data. So I have to change the axis of rotation. And what you need to understand is in space, that axis of rotation is not fixed. It's changing. And then also, we, as a result, we have a radius. You can see the gray line I've got drawn from the axis of rotation to the circumference of the circle. And that is not on vertical, that's off of vertical. So now we have a plane angle, okay? And then we also have the direction of the circle, which is the swing direction. And I think you define it at low point, correct? Yes. Swing direction at low point. This yes. is not swing direction at address, which I think I misinterpreted a few presentations ago, but it's swing direction at low point. And then we have the low point of the circle and it's very important that the low point of the circle, it's before impact, it's not impact. I'd have to, uh, with a robot, I'd have to lift the putter up to about five to eight millimeters off the ground or hover the putter to get low point at impact. Does everybody understand that? So because we start with the putter on the ground, zero millimeters, as we come to impact, we're gonna impact about five to eight millimeters off the ground so low point is actually the putter's rising. We're having a slight rise of the butt of the club and the head, which is low point is further back. So we do this so that we don't hit the ground. Everybody got that? So low point is not necessarily at impact unless we hover. And then as a result of this, we're using a portion of that circle, and that is the path arc. So Christian, did I kind of explain that pretty, pretty clearly? Yes, I think um, this is a very powerful concept um, to explain uh, a putting stroke as a circular movement, or as you said, like a wheel, because then all of a sudden we have a different picture of actually the task, because very many students, they only think about impact and they're irrespective of how they get there, they try to somehow steer to impact to get things done at impact. Now, what you say is, okay, no, it's kind of the integrity of this kind of wheel which ensures that at impact, you match up to the target line and the ball would start straight, which is a completely different concept. And I like this approach. Yeah, well, here's the interesting thing. And, and uh, you know, golf, you know, I'm an avid skier, right? We've talked about that. So it's funny, putting and skiing are not necessarily line games. They're circle games. You just happen to be standing on two straight lines and holding two straight lines, but it's a circle game. You're dealing with a radius, okay? With putting, it's not entirely by itself in a line game, but yet everybody's got lines on balls, lines on putter, trying to move the putter in a straight line. 3D, do not move in a straight line. So make sure that you write this down. Putting is not in itself a line game. You gotta get that out of your head. And we'll do some examples here pretty soon of, of a tour player trying to move the putter in a vertical arc versus an amateur trying to move the putter straight back, straight through. And we'll see how the rules of axis of rotation, radius, plane angle, swing direction are all changing. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But you got to get out of your head that putting's a line game. Well, that, yeah, that's, it, yeah. that's, yeah, that's, it's huge. yeah, I very much because like our that. Joint so what, yeah, why, do we, why, do, why, why do you think um, that people think it's a line game? Because they try to keep it simple, distance and direction. Okay. I got to go from here to there. I just keep the putter straight with the face square, the putt's going to go in, but they don't realize the effect of that theory, how it affects the rotation of every joint in the coordinative structure. Mm. Let me give an example. Dr. Sasha McKenzie showed me this. If I were to take my hand pass and throw a dart dead straight, did you know that there's a rotation at the shoulder? That's a circular motion. Mm -hmm. There's a rotation at the elbow. That's a circular motion. There's a rotation at the wrist. That's a circular motion. And there's a rotation at the uh, MCP joint. That's a rotation. So I've got four circles, four circular motions just to produce a trajectory of a straight line mm. and it's a complete disaster which you're gonna see everybody here is gonna see how much of a disaster disaster it truly is to try to move 
a putter in a straight line. It's a complete disaster. You guys ready? We are ready, I hope so. <laughs> okay. Okay, so example number one is a putting robot. This would be like an Iron Archie that uh, you can see that the swing plane is in green and we have a plane angle of about 80 degrees. So it's 10 degrees off a of vertical. And we have a face plane that is also about 80 degrees. So go figure, a robot's gonna keep the face square to the radius or to the arc or to the plane. And you'll notice that the radius is constant. So it's very important to go look at this first tile right here. Does everybody see how constant and consistent, 99%, how straight the, the radius has been maintained? Write this down. This is one of the biggest differences between a robot and a human golfer. Okay, you're gonna see it for yourself. So those of you that say the word pendulum, I think after this presentation, you might never ever say it again, ever. Got it? Okay, now the direction of this circle at low point is the second tile up here on the right, and it is one degree to the right which makes sense if I'm hitting up a, a degree or two on the, on the circle. So it's the D plane, correct, uh, Christian, that principle that yes. if I'm hitting a little up, I got to shift the circle a little bit to the right. So yes. it's no wonder that we love a stroke that looks a little bit arced inside and it looks a little bit down the line, but it's really not down the line. It's just the circle's been tilted or shifted and the putter's starting to go a little more vertical. Okay, so we sit there and we go, oh man, that Tiger Woods stroke is so pure, man. That looks so good. He looks like he's drawing his putt, right? That's just because the swing plane might, has been shifted and that's what we see. All right, now, and with our naked eye, a lot of times we're not actually seeing the path, we're seeing the swing direction with our naked eye. Because I think you have to measure with, obviously with Sam Putt Lab, you have to measure to see the difference where the path is going, where the swing direction is two different things. And then the low point you can see with this robot. So did you hover the robot a little bit to make good contact? Well, it depends on where you start with a, uh, I try to shift it a little bit to the back, uh, to, to the front, gotcha. other way around. Gotcha. Uh, so, uh, gotcha. yeah. And then you can see the robots producing a path arc of 7.5 degrees per meter, which is a slight arc, which you can see also in the upper right, uh, upper right tile. Okay, and then over here, you can see the face plane angle, uh, it's square to the path. It's rel I mean, 79.9 and 80.3, 80 I mean, that's just, that's pretty tight. And the radius, 1.27. Uh, Christian, you might wanna explain why that's off just a little bit, why the, why the, the radius of the face, uh, swing plane versus the radius of the face plane is different, even on a robot, I mean, but they're relatively the same. Well, um, so um, actually, if we measure a robot with PutLab, we'd sometimes see that the robot also is not perfect because he is mechanically a little bit instable, more instable than we think. So we see that there are certain oscillations uh, which are the same if you repeat it. And um, if I have worked with Ping and I've seen their robot and they put a kind of a ton of weight onto the robot to don't let him move, the basic so support, see, yeah. Yeah, so we see that with a kind of a normal robot, which we construct by just bending a little bit of steel, uh, would probably not be 100% perfect. So sometimes with PutLab, we measure the inaccuracy of the robot. Gotcha, gotcha. But oscillations is what, is what we're seeing there. All right, cool. So everybody understands that the green is the swing plane, which is the sweet spot plane, correct, Christian? Yes, and it's the plane that best fits through the interpolation of these data points. And we extrapolate the radius and the plane angle, correct? That's what we do, yes. Very good. So did everybody get that? We've got the data points of the sweet spot. We interpolate that data. We extrapolate from that data, the radius and the plane angle. Exactly, okay. that's just the regression fit and the best solution is then your result. Very good. Okay, what would, what would be something at address here? Just 
curious that we could change the radius. Well, we could change to a more upright posture. We could lengthen the limbs at the shoulder, at the elbow, at the wrist. We can lengthen the putter. We can stand further from the ball. There's lots of things that we can do address to establish a different radius, distant length. Now, once we start to move, things change. Correct? Okay. Now, so, let's take so, a look. So maybe maybe if you go back and uh, what you just explained, I think that's a imp important point because this is also a little bit difficult to understand if you don't have the picture in front of you. If we look at the, um, the, this template above the data, which is the arc rotation template, in the report, so we try to say, okay, you have a specific swing plane and a radius. And if the swing plane is becoming more flat, which means you are probably more away from the ball, for example, then you would increase arc and rotation. If you are more close to the ball, swing plane becomes more steep. You're decreasing arc and rotation. Same for radius. Yeah. So if your radius is becoming smaller, you increase arc and rotation. If your radius is becoming larger, you increase arc and rotation. So we see that arc and rotation are directly linked to the angle, the tilt angle of your plane and the radius. So there's a direct link basically of your wheel and the attributes of your wheel. And then what you see as a putting stroke. And this is, this is I think something uh, once you understood, it's it's becoming very clear. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, your that was perfect. Thank you for doing that. Um, specifically to to kind of define what what's going on with the swing plane and face plane. Now we haven't said much about the gray line, which is the shaft plane. And in this uh, in this software edition, it's fixed at seventy degrees. So right now it's fixed, but you said like in the future it'll be the actual shaft plane, correct? Yes, we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. There's a there's a video out there on YouTube demonstrating a putting stroke with an iron archie on a putting arc and they got the shaft all bent up and they show, oh, the see the shaft plane doesn't matter. Well, what's interesting is uh, some people can fall for that BS, but not everyone. They never changed the axis of rotation and the distance between the sweet spot and that axis of rotation. So if you believe in robot theory, then the shaft doesn't matter. If, and, and, and in this case, you can see that the plane of the sweet spot and the plane of the face plane are much more up through the neck and the shoulder or the upper spine, you can see that. And the shaft is on a plane that is lower. So it's very important to see from this view, that the sweet spot plane is above the shaft plane. So it would have very much the feeling of the club head arc staying above the shaft. And, it, and the feeling of that is a slight U, a U-ing motion in the vertical plane. In the lateral vertical plane, it'll feel like a little bit of a U shape, okay? So, so in this case, the shaft doesn't matter, but please write this down. The shaft serves as a proxy for the radius, it's a proxy because the putter head can't move if a shaft wasn't attached to it and your hands and arms are not attached to it. So while in this example, the shaft plane doesn't really matter because it's gonna be making a slight out of plane or lateral vertical U shape to the shaft, the sweet spot plane is gonna hold in relationship to the shoulder center or the top of the spine. Now we're gonna to go to another example. And here, this is a world, former world number one, a first world go golf ranking top 10 player A, is uh, one of my past clients. And you'll notice that the shaft plane, the swing plane, the face plane are almost laying perfectly on top of each other. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. And his face at impact, his face data is zero, zeros. They're fantastic. The stroke looks amazing. He was ranked 206 in strokes gained putting with, when this data was taken. Okay. <laughs> wow. 
Now, how did the plane shift like the robot from up here down into the forearm in the middle of the torso? It's really simple. The robot has, what was it one degree of freedom in just one plane back and forth, correct? Lateral and vertical, right? Well, this is a human being who gets some rotation from some internal rotation in the lead shoulder in the backswing and some external rotation, maybe a little bit of elbow uh, extension, elbow flexion. And we're only talking in degrees, like a degree or a half a degree. And that rotation flattens the face plane and that arm motion lowers the swing plane. So he feels as if, remember I said with a robot, it might feel like a slight ewing motion. Well, this player is going to feel like the shaft and the forearms are in the same plane. So you can see my elbows are actually working slightly. You can see a slight extension of the trail shoulder. And it, you can see a slight elbow flexion. So there's a little bit of arm motion and shoulder motion that's creating this flattening of both planes. Now, very important, the radius, go ahead and look at this first tile. The radius is not constant, but it is shortening. And why is it shortening? Because we go from addressing the putter on the ground to striking it, rising five to eight millimeters off the ground. And where does it shorten the most? At the lead elbow at the trail form, the trajectory of the trail form is working kind of up and in. So it's coming from joint motion, write that down. These changes of radius are coming from joint motion. A robot zeroes out the degrees of freedom except for the pivot point. Human being is using these degrees of freedom, which we'll talk about later. So this is pretty cool here, isn't it? All right, so the previous, there's the robot. How many degrees of freedom in the shoulder of the robot? Zero. How many degrees of freedom in the elbow of the robot? Zero. How many degrees of freedom in the wrist? Zero. It's a solid structure. Go to the human being. He's got not only motion in the, in the, the, the spine, but motion in the shoulder blade. He's got motion in the, uh, the upper arm, the glenohumeral joint. He's got motion in the elbow, the forearm, the wrist, both radial and ulnar deviation. So th that's what produces that flatter shift. And I think you're gonna see with most good golfers or good putters, not every good putter, but most, that the they're, they're, they're using these degrees of freedom. They're not reducing them. One person that's reducing them is obviously Bryson DeChambeau. And I don't even know if I can, I, I don't even know how to do it. I got to torque myself up to the point where nothing can move. So anyway, now let's take a look at example number three. Okay, here we go. Uh, pretty good player, former world number one. Uh, just recently got in a truck or a car accident, like recent. But you can see here that there's lots of rotation. The face plane is extremely flat and the swing plane is very much through the, through the shoulder plane, kind of like the robot. So it'd be interesting to see if he practices on a putting arc or some type of similar thing for his sweet spot. And his putters to like a, uh, I, don't th I don't know, like an 8802 to feel the relative rotation. So there's a lot of relative rotation that's produ producing the face plane being flatter than the swing plane. Did I say that correctly? Christian? Yes. yes. So that's a huge amount of relative rotation, which is 8.7 opening of the face relative to the path, which is basically because of the plane angles. Yes. And then once again, the swing radius is shortening. So we've got two top 10 players that do not look like the robot, correct? At least Very two, good. yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe most. Uh, how about the swing plane angle increasing? So the, the plane, it's starting to go more vertical, starting to go more in the vertical plane, not in the horizontal plane. Putter's going lateral vertical. All right. So this is very important. And you, you might look at the, the, uh, 
you might look at the swing direction tile and say, oh, that's straight back, straight through. Well, it's still an arc of 7.7 .7 degrees per meter. It's a very slight arc. And one of the reasons also why the plane is a little bit more upright is that he has an angle uh, of the shaft in the hand. So you can see how it's not in the lifeline, but it's at an angle. This does two things. It shifts the plane up, but it also invites some relative rotation. So just by how he holds the club across the angle of the hand with the longer thumb, as opposed to like this, you can see the difference. You can see the difference there. Is it Christian? Can you guys see this? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can roughly see it. <laughs> it's a little bit small. No, yeah, yeah, we can see it. The video is just yeah, a good. small portion of the screen. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. So just by changing where the shaft is in the hand and the length of the the thumb. Uh, and then obviously the radiation, uh, that can change that drastically to where that would be a moderate arc instead of a slight arc. So uh, let's see here. Next one, another top 10 player. So I've, I've given you three top 10 players here. So now we've got a player, top 10 player format client of mine where the swing plane that, that is moving more in the transverse or horizontal arc. It's a real flat, the sweet spot's going in a strong arc or moderate arc, but he's under twisting, trying to keep the face square. All right, he's trying to keep the face square. So you're see, you'll see a little bit of flexion and ulnar deviation. And those two things produce supination of the lead wrist and a little bit of extension in the trail wrist with ulnar gives you a little bit of pronation. So there's just this little twist away and the putter ends up shut. So he's gonna start missing things to the left. So he'll start working. You'll see the radius start to work. The radius looks inside down the line, but it's actually it's coming from a low attack angle to a more vertical. So you can see him trying to block, rock and block to, slow, to keep that putter from, from hitting put, uh, pulls. And then, so if you look at here at swing radius, that doesn't look like the robot at all. It's coming from a reduced radius to a longer radius. Okay. And you can also see that the arc here is a moderate arc. So what I did with this guy was I just added more rotation to match the arc. That's all we did. We got him to stop twisting it shut with his, his hands and forearms. So basically I said, stop keeping it square. To me like what i said dude stop keeping the face square to the path he goes well i thought i'm supposed to i said dude if i took and tried to keep the face square to the path with a driver what would i look like i said you're only square to the path a few inches before impact and a few inches after impact if the path is neutral I said, trying to keep the face square throughout the entire motion, biomechanically, you're going to start having a counter rotation, right? That down. you're going to have a counter rotation of the whole system. The whole system in the backswing is going clockwise and the system as a whole on the downswing is going counterclockwise. Well, if you're trying to keep the face square throughout the whole stroke, you're going to have some counter rotation and the forearms, the upper arm might start to abduct away. And you're going to start seeing these uh, sequence of forearm, wrist, uh, ulnar deviation, as well as flexion extension changes. So what's interesting is I have a, uh, a 3D system that Dr. Rob Neal um, has trained me on for eight years. I've been studying this stuff for eight years, 3D in the body. And you can pull up a little app. Um, called Skelly, S-K-E-L-L-Y. And it's, an, it's a posable art skeleton, but it's got all the degrees of freedom. And you can sit there and play around with Skelly and you would notice that if I didn't have any rotation, counter rotation, that if I just rotated the human body, it would be a strong arc with lots of rotation. So when you're trying to keep the face square, you need to keep in mind that you are actually counter rotating in the backswing and then vice versa on the downswing. Sorry about the little rant there, but trying to keep the face square for that long 
it's just biome- biomechanically a disaster. It's one, it's one of the biggest reasons why golfers I, I see with good golfers hit the, hit the left tee gate is they've twisted it shut in the backswing and then they, they throw it with the right arm. All right, back to the presentation. So we've had, this guy doesn't look like the robot. He's top 10. This guy doesn't look like the robot. He's top 10. This guy looks like a robot. He's top 10. Doesn't look like a robot. So we've had three players that are top 10 that don't look like a robot. Okay. Now let's take a look at this player. Now this guy here is one of the top putters of all time. He's held some PGA Tour records uh, in putting. And you'll see how the swing plane is very, very flat. A very strong arc, 45.5 degrees per meter. And what's interesting is it actually hits down on the putt. You see how low point is actually, it's not before impact, should be after impact. I didn't change that there, but negative 9.1 millimeters means after impact. So please forgive me for the error. Um, I didn't change the, the, ty- the, the word before to after when I was clone, uh, copying the slide. And he's hitting it left, but the radius is still shortening. So we've got four players in a row that the radius is shortening, it's not constant. So these things like keeping the radius constant, keep the face square throughout the stroke, they're not good concepts. Matter of fact, it just shows a very uh, lack of understanding of what's actually going on. Now, what's interesting is he also has a lot of, it, the face plane shows a lot of rotation, but the most of that's coming from the strength of the arc so he's not really rotating it per se like this. It's rotating relative to the uh, target line because it's doing a lot of this motion. Can you guys see that? There's a yes. lot of arc in the transverse horizontal plane like so. All right. So it's not that he's opening and closing it a lot because it's actually the opposite. Okay. Uh Christian, do you see anything else there on that slide that's of interest to you other than the radius is shortening? He's hitting down and it's a very strong arc. Yeah, so I think what is impressive is to see all these differences. Well, this is just empirical and uh, we see at least that uh, things are different uh, in in the human body as compared to a robot. So basically the problem already starts with the shoulders as there is not this one joint. And so uh, I think you will talk more about these five uh, joints, which are... Uh, yeah, we'll talk active. more about them here yeah. at the end. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Yeah, 100%. Sure. Okay, so we've got four tour players that don't look like the... Uh, f- four really good players that don't look like a robot theory. Okay, now we have a PGA Tour player who was a client of mine who at one time, he's won a couple times on tour, but he always struggled with his putting, always. And he would set up a lot of uh, forward flexion, elbows outside the shoulder. He was just kind of built kind of big up like this. And he was a, he would rock in a vertical plane. So when you look at this, this is rocking laterally and vertically in a vertical plane. So the putter's literally going like this. He's not trying to move it in a straight line. He's just rocking. So I think there's two, two variants of straight back, straight through. I think there's the rocking in a lateral vertical plane. And then there's those golfers that are literally trying to move it in a straight line, which we're going to see next. Okay. But again, the radius is shortening. And now this is very important. I want you to take a look at the swing plane angle. Do you see how that looks like a U shape? Does everybody see the third tile there? Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's an indicator of out of plane movement, out of the plane movement to try to produce a lateral vertical. So he's almost trying to like completely get rid of any transverse horizontal plane movement, just pure lateral vertical. And that's what it feels like. Here, do it yourself right now. If you've got your putter in your hand, just take the putter back and make just the slightest bit of a U motion. And you'll start to see the hand path and, and the arms starting to rock. You can see the abduction away from the armpit, back toward the armpit, away from the armpit. And that's what's happening is they're working in the, uh, the axis of rotation at the shoulder is now working instead of around this plane here, 
it's rotating around this plane here. So that's very important to see. So you can see where the Ewing motion would come from this way versus it rotating this way. So I'm using th three orthogonal angles here. Okay, so it's rotating around this axis, this being the dominant axis, and then this rotating in th around this axis. So it's how the player moves their arms relative to each axis in the, each joint. Okay, so that's a U shape, straight back, straight through. Now, one of my favorite. Why does this guy struggle with putting? Tries to move the putter straight back, straight through. You can see, whoops, let me go to the previous one here. So you can see the backswing is also short. And if you looked at his acceleration profile, it's increasing through the roof. And he's making sure that he follows through. So let's write this down. Why does this guy suck at putting? He's trying to move the putter straight back, straight through. Write that down. That's reason number one. Reason number two, he's taking it back too short for the putt that he's hitting. So the system is underloaded. So therefore, he has to increase the acceleration. So peak velocity is no longer at impact, it's a little bit after. And he's making sure that he follows through. Well, he's following through by changing the radius. And look at how much this radius is changing. Look at how much this swing plane angle is changing. Look at how it's an inverted arc. It's an inverted arc. And he did do it through his setup. He did it because he's trying to move the putter in a straight line. These are the consequences of the cliches that we as coaches keep using and we must stop. We must stop using the word pendulum. We must stop using the word triangle. We must stop, say, take it back short. Make sure you accelerate through the ball. Make sure you follow through because our folks are doing these things. And this is what it produces. If you say those cliches like you sound like you know what you're talking about with putting. This is what it produces. And I have to fix it every time people come. Change your concept. All right, there's my little, that's rant number one, because we got a bigger one coming. All right, sorry, Christian. But you can see here the player is struggling with radius, which is the same reason why he can't chip the ball. It's the same reason why he can't pitch the ball. It's the same reason why he can't uh, hit the ball of the bunker. This guy was a four handicap, uh, good fella, loved him to death, but he putted like he's a 20, 25. Four handicap with this putting stroke. And his goal was just to become a zero. I look forward to seeing him again in our next session. Okay, now back to the robot. This is a different robot. The other robot was built where the axis of rotation is up through the upper spine and the shoulder. This robot is set up more like, almost like the plane angle. Again, the swing radius is very constant. The swing direction is a degree to the right at low point. The plane angle is fairly consistent and the face plane is fairly consistent. So if we go back through these, how many human beings look like a robot? How many? One, no, two, no, three, no, four, no, five, no. Look it. So you cannot use a robot to compare your player's strokes to should not be striving to get the numbers that a robot would produce. You should not be striving to get graphs that look like what a robot would look like because I'm gonna show you why here in a minute. There's a huge difference between a robot and a human being. Okay, we ready? Putting robots versus a human golfer. On the left is Iron Archie. Good dude. Had his, I had his son, Iron Archie Jr., for about a year or two on loan from uh, uh, the guys at the putting arc. There's a degrees of freedom problem here. Well, what's interesting is there's a central nervous system solution. So please write that down. There's a degrees of freedom problem versus a central nervous system solution. The human brain is absolutely amazing. And Christian is far more of an expert on this than I am. 
but we are designed we are designed to survive we are designed to to stand upright we are we are designed to find food and find shelter our nervous system is an alert system oh there's danger you know so it our our nervous system is amazing because our nerves our nerves control our muscles and our muscles control move our bones and our joints. And the nervous system knows how to, with through motor patterns, how to make adjustments on the run. So Christian, if you don't mind, can you just kind of give us a brief kind of uh, synapse of what goes on with the nervous system versus the robot? Well, so actually, if you would imagine a robot, for example, writing a letter. Um, okay. And if we do that with our hand, um, we, we clearly see in a second that irrespective of the position of the hand, the letter always looks the same. So we, we, we plan our movement in external coordinates and we don't care how we need to move the joints or at what angle the joints are. So if you invert the hand or if you do it from upside or down, the letter would always look the same, but you need to have very different joint angles and even different muscles acting. Even if you ride with your foot, your riding would look the same. So that's the central nervous system. We don't care what we need to do to achieve a certain target, for example, to move the putter. Um, we, we are able to adapt to it in a way that it creates synergy and that certainly it's always functional what we do. So it's not just random. So yeah, but that's our nervous system. Um, if we if we grasp, for example, we need to coordinate six, 26 muscles and we have about 23 joints just for grasping. Uh, but we can grasp from different angles and all these 26 muscles and 23 joints would act differently if we grab to, uh, uh, grab to the left or to the right. So that's about our nervous system. And this is so difficult for a robot because a robot has only one program, one solution, and that's it. Everything is fixed. And that's not true for our nervous system. So we react to the task. And basically this is important in putting. Beautiful, beautiful, thank you. Okay, so um, this is a, uh, a video that I'm gonna play. So I'm gonna be quiet for a little bit. I'm gonna let you watch. And right now we're just looking at the head, the torso, the pelvis. In a minute, we'll be looking at the lead arm versus the trail arm. Uh, this is Hunter Mahan, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it doesn't look like much is going on, right? But if you're looking at the numbers over here on the right, there's a lot going on. So certain components are mobile and other components are stable. Now, just looking at the lead arm versus the trail arm, you can just see how there is motion from the shoulder on the lead shoulder, and there's motion from the trail shoulder. You can see that. So you sit there and you go 140 degrees versus, you know, 145. That's five degrees of rotation just from the trail shoulder. Hmm. Interesting. Geez, you wonder why your putter is five degrees open in the backswing and five degrees closed on a 10 foot putt? Well, geez. A lot of it just came from internal and external rotation. And then the plane of it being more upright kind of negates some of that. And if there's any tilting going on, it counters some of that. So this, the whole system is being managed by the nervous system. So like Christian said, you have to develop new patterns of movement. So how do I do that? I change concepts in their mind. I change their plan. And then they, they start to come up with solutions through coordination. So really you're changing somebody's coordination. I'd write that down. When you're changing, you're not really changing some stroke, you're changing to a new pattern, something that's new. The old pattern's still there, but they're learning to coordinate a new pattern. That's what we're teaching and putting. So if somebody struggles with coordination, no wonder they, they, they have a hard time putting. They're uncomfortable or they're not aware. So this is what I do. It's like we're, uh, as putting coaches, Christian, we're coordination specialists, so to speak. I call it the offensive and defensive coordinator. That's what the, the nervous system's doing. It's coordinating plans and plays and how we're going to do this. All right. So 
Uh, hopefully that was pretty interesting. So now here comes my rant. So if you thought the rant before was a rant, this is really a rant. You're lucky I'm on my medication uh, today because most of you that do know me, I am bipolar. So I did take my medication this morning. All right, players use a variety of ways to generate speed and manage direction. I think I'd make a note on that right there. The way the person's moving is they're trying to generate speed. They're trying to manage direction with both shoulders, both arms and both hands, maybe a little more dominated from the trail side. Maybe the lead side's doing something to, to counter, counteract that or block something from movement uh, happening. Based on the current data, no one moves the putter in exactly the same way. And what I mean by that is the pattern might be the same, but the absolute values and numbers might not be exactly the same numbers. Uh, better players are more consistent in their pattern movement. They're more coordinated. They have finer coordination. Why? Because the arms, hands, and wrists take care of the finer movement. Those little half degrees here and little uh, one degree here, negative one degree there, it's taken care of with the finer movements. It's definitely where the gold is. The gold is in the hand. I'm not saying that we should be wristy from a short putt. Okay, I'm saying that the finer movements come from here. See, you, you, you can look at my motion and say he's not wristy, but I can tell you right now, there is maybe a degree of motion here on, or two on a motion uh, on a short putt. And as the putt gets longer, there might be a little bit more. Sometimes it's just coming from the inertia of the club. Sometimes our wrist movements are just purely from the inertia of the club. Uh, okay, so now wrist extension flexions tend to manage the in-plane motion the radius, the three-dimensional path, loft, face, rotation, and speed. R uh, radial ulnar tend to manage the out-of-plane motion, the radius, three-dimensional path, lie, and impact spot. Minimal forearm pronation and uh, supination tend to manage around the shaft motion, face rotation, twist velocity, etc. The elbow extension, elbow flexion tends to man manage the radius, the height of impact, and the rise angle. Upper arms and shoulders tend to manage a lot of stuff. There's a lot going on in the shoulder complex, which includes the humerus, the glenohumeral joint, shoulder blade, and the clavicle. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, golfers' central nervous system act as both a offensive and defensive coordinator of the movement pattern. For you football addicts out there, you know what I'm talking about. Putting is both an art and a science. 3D measures how and what the artist painted, but only the artist knows the why. You need to change the why. Please write that down. Why is this dude changing the radius? Why? Because he's trying to take it back straight, back straight through. He's trying to take it back uh, short. He's trying to accelerate through the ball and he's trying to follow through. This is why he moves that way. You need to get to know what the why is and you need to change the why. I love this fixer because you can see where the magic happens. Here's the three-dimensional figure inside of the swing plane, which is the subject that we talked about today. There's a moment of silence. <laughs> uh, that was just impressive, really. I very much like... Um like this stuff. So I, I think I very much like also the idea, okay, what's the difference between kind of stiffness and a little bit of stability, but still mobility. Yeah. So as you said, it could be only a degree, but this degree in the wrist, it makes a difference. And, and, and it's so difficult to, to get the, to come to this point to feel, okay, uh, I am stable, but I'm not stiff. And so the difference I think is is very difficult to be understood. For example, for amateurs, a lot they don't really understand that stability and stiffness is different. This is huge. Uh, I, I so you know I started back skiing after thirty years off, and I'm really you know I'm really into it, right? And one of the things that's important to understand about coordination is good athletes know how to separate movement. That's where some stability comes from. In other words, 
in skiing, there might be a rotation, but there might be a counter rotation the opposite way. That makes sense. So in other words, the ability to separate the motion, write this down, the ability to separate the motion of the upper body from the lower body. I can do that sitting in my chair. The ability to separate the shoulder motion from my head motion. But what's interesting is the shoulders are going clockwise, the torso is tilting, uh, excuse me, counterclockwise, torso is tilting clockwise. But I've got to do this in a way that my head stays relatively stable. So there's counter, there's counter rotations going on. So the ability to separate motions, some are stable, some are mobile, is probably at the heart and soul of a player that looks fluid versus a player that doesn't separate. They look like Frankenstein when they walk and they look like Frankenstein when they putt. They're not, they, don't, they don't have this ability to separate movements or counteract movements. And uh, that's something that I learned big time, uh, not just in putting, but uh, in skiing and going up the lift and watching all these skiers come down. You can see the people that can separate uh, what their legs and hips are doing versus what their pelvis is doing versus what their torso is doing. So same thing in putting. Can you separate? That'd be a good question in your next lesson. Can this player separate the movement of the upper body and the lower? Now, that when something is stable, it doesn't mean it's still. Empire State Building is stable, but it's not still. The pelvis might rotate a degree or two in the backswing or the downswing, but it's not still. It's stable. The job of the pelvis is stability. The job of the torso is mobility. The lumbar spine acts as a joint in between the torso and the, and the pelvis. The, the cervical spine acts as a joint between the shoulder complex and the skull. So it's learning to separate these movements that create mobility and stability. Your thoughts on that, Christian? Well, <laughs> that's beyond my, my knowledge, to be honest. So that's, that's amazing information. Uh, I very much like that. Uh, I need to learn more from you. So when do we all have... <laughs> Well, we all have our, you know, everybody here, everybody that's listening has a gift. It's just whether you're using it to bless other people, right? You know, so every, you're gifted in creating such an incredible software for putting. How many years now? 16? How old uh, is Sam? I think 2003 we started. It's 17 years now. So Sam is a 17-year-old, huh? Yeah, it's becoming next year adult <laughs> next year sam will be an adult i'll have to have a throw a party for him he'll be able to drink a beer no or in, at least in canada not in the u.s but uh, but yeah it's uh everybody here that's listening has a gift as a coach otherwise they probably wouldn't be coaching and everybody here that's listening has the ability to do something new something different i tell preston combs this all the time dude you're not me so don't copy me You've got your own gift and, and you're going to bless people with that. You know, I tell Gavin Parker that, you know, his, so everybody's got their own gift. You just got to figure out what it is, maximize it, share it, and bless other people with it. Right. Okay, perfect. So uh, maybe if you close your presentation and we can have a look at the check, if there are any more open questions or, or although I think you have answered so many questions without getting the questions, but maybe there are some uh, questions in the chat. Can you please check in your chat if there's anything? There's five questions. Okay, but um, I think um, yeah. most of them are coming from before. Um, oh, are they? Okay, no problem. Uh, so are there any more questions or you can raise your hands? Um, yes, the player is Stan Utley. <laughs> Cab Hargrave said is, D, is player D staying out late. Yes. The angle of the putter in these players will be how much different? Not much. Uh, JP, uh, most uh, lie angles, um, you know, they're going to be between 68 and 72 as a range. You get, you know, you get the strickers and you get the fuzzy zellers that are, that are outliers. Um, it's interesting. You know, all coaches have preferences. Um I don't like people that are extreme, um, but if they putt well, I leave them alone. 
But the thing is, is there's a, I look at putter fitting as not getting good numbers. I fit putters to motion. Mm. I fit, I, I look at the putter as just a third arm. Does that make sense? So does that arm need to be heavy? Does that arm need to be light? Does that arm need to be, rotate with the system or, or slow the system down? So I look at the inertial properties of the putter and the design and go, well, does it match the motion of what the body's doing? Cause it's a third arm. And I got that concept of third arm from an old full swing mentor of mine, Mac O'Grady back in 2000, yeah, 2000, 2001, 2002 is the club is just a, a third arm. You know what I mean? So I think with putter fitting, I, I don't, I don't, I might have a putter, like I might be fitting a tour player and he pumps out good numbers with four different designs. Right. But if you look at the graphs, they're a little different. They're a little smoother with one than the other. There's a little noisier than the other. And then I'll ask them, well, which one do you think, you know, is working with you instead of against you? And, you know, eight, nine times out of 10, it's, it's the one that's the smoothest with the graphs and, you know, but yeah, I fit putters to motion, not to geometry and robot theory and this plane angle and that distance from the ball and that arc and this, you know, you have to fit it to the motion. Oh, that's, that's, that's very good. So actually, um, in motor research, we have this concept of incorporation of objects. So basically, if you use an object and if it creates synergy, Let's say, because I'm coming from handwriting, I know a lot about handwriting. So actually, if you have a pen, it is part of your hand. You don't even feel that it is a pen in your hand because you feel the pen tip as if the pen would be part of your body, which is called incorporation. And so what you explain is exactly incorporation of the putter. So if it matches up to your motion, you don't feel that it's a putter. It's just a limb. It's becoming a a part of your body and then you can create synergy so this is a very good concept i think yeah so okay, creating that's synergy that's cool Some uh more questions yeah we got a chat whoops not i don't need numbers i need chat uh some of my posse are trying to load up some questions uh five fatal stroke compared to the traditional stroke i don't know i haven't i don't deal with those folks Uh, thoughts on backswing and timing to impact. They differ in distance. This is huge. Uh, there was a company out there that tried to sell everybody that you had to have a 0.6 backswing and a 0.3 downswing, and you got to be two to one. And I measure golfers from three feet, six feet, nine feet, 12 feet, all the way out to 60 feet. They're borrowing more time in the backswing, not, not only length and time. So this concept of trying to keep the rhythm ratio perfectly two to one is kind of a BS thing, to be honest with you. I'm calling bullshit on it because I got data to prove it otherwise. Uh, Charles Sanderson, Sanderson Woods, how can you help players with coordination between body parts to have stability and not stiffness? Uh, great question. Uh, you have to pray a lot, go to church, give tithes so that, you can, that God can open up their ability. And I'm just kidding. But and seriously, in a way, it, how do you develop coordination? You develop coordination. It's a brain thing. It's it's learning to move differently. So I use uh, differential learning. Charles, uh, we'll take a stroke that goes short backswing, long follow through, long backswing, short follow through. Give me give me symmetrical, and we keep doing this. And then what's interesting is throughout the lesson, as they're learning the new pattern. I make them do the old pattern every once in a while, like every 10 minutes. And what's interesting is they go, I, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it the new way. And I say, well, why is that? I say, well, the old way feels weird, but wait a minute, 45 minutes ago, you said it, the new way felt weird. And what's happening is the brain is starting to develop the new pattern and it's starting to choose the path of least resistance. So it's starting to go, well, wait a minute, when I had the ball back, the shaft back, and I was kind of doing this, That wasn't efficient when I had the shaft here and my wrists and forearms here and I was doing that, that was more efficient. So what's funny is I, I keep, keep doing this differential learning and after a while, they don't choose how to move it. The brain chooses how to move it. 
Okay, perfect. So there's another question of Christian Barnard asking, how does the side saddle stroke compare to traditional stroke? Okay, that's okay, you answer that. So maybe we need just to be careful that because I planned it for two hours, we have one minute left. So if, if we are kicked out, uh, it, it might happen, but I think we can just continue for a second. I think um, with regards to coordination and stability, actually um, we do it all day and uh, maybe the, the, there's a misunderstanding of the task that we think, okay, if we are stiff, we are more stable. That's maybe a misunderstanding because if I grasp, for example, a glass, if I, if I handle an object, I use a minimum amount of grip force and it's still stable. So we are used to do that in daily life, but we just think that, okay, if, I, if I'm becoming more stiff, um, there's less shaking, but that's actually not true because otherwise we would drink differently. So it's kind of the balance between how much do I need and still being fluid and, and stable. And we are, we are used to it in daily life. So, so there's some competences we can also bring in from daily life into putting. Gotcha, gotcha. Robert just asked in a good stroke, is there a little ulnar deviation in the backswing and radial in the forward swing? And I would say in, I wouldn't classify that in a good stroke. I would say in an inside down the line stroke, you would see ulnar deviation in the backswing and radial on the through swing from maybe the lead wrist or maybe even the trail wrist. But that doesn't mean I can't do it arcing left and do, go into radial as well. So it just depends on the movement pattern. So when you classified it in there, you threw a bone in there, Robert, saying in a good stroke. It's in, in, in a certain pattern, is there little ulnar deviation in the back swing and radial in the forward swing? Is it effective? It can be, yes. Okay. All right, we got any more? Why do I not have face plane in my professional report? Because okay. you might not have the pro version. All the newest, the, the latest software, there is an update uh, actually, which is out coming with yep. the studio in parallel, which is having um, face plane also. So um, you will have it soon. Otherwise you need yeah. to ask for the update. Gotcha. Tim uh, Crumnow asked a great question. Do you prefer the wrist to be quiet or have a little hinge on the backstroke and a little unhinging on the forward stroke to help release the putter? Well, again, it depends on the pattern. I would say from inside of five feet, if you were to put a measuring device on the wrist, there might be little minimal to no wrist movement on a very, very short putt, but there might be some. Um, as we get further away from the hole, you're gonna start to see there's might be some flexion extension changes, but it depends on the grip type. If I turn my hands like this, now the answer to the question is no, there's gonna be radial ulnar, radial ulnar. It's only gonna be flexion extension this way if it's neutral. That's why I don't, I have a preference as a coach to not allow people to hold the club the way they feel like it, unlike the full swing guys. Full swing guys, they just let people grip it any old which way and then they try to position the club. There's my rant on that. But I like to have the hand somewhat close to relatively neutral because if they're not, now moving the club in plane involves ulnar, maybe some flexion, maybe that produces a supination, which is actually twisting the club shut to open. So there's lots of reasons why. I pay very big, close attention to thumbs, fingers, hands, wrists, forearms. Uh, I don't just let people do what the hell they want to do. So I thought it was a good question, though. Any more? Oh, we got one more. We got another one. Oh, the Preston, Preston, uh, Preston Combs was listening. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Preston. Thank you for being uh, Hi, Preston. by your presence. Yeah. Okay, anything else there, Christian, you, you want to talk about? How about in the 3D software, the SAM 3D software? Yes, um, as I said, we will introduce faceplane and then uh, the faceplane, which is dynamic. We will introduce that uh, shortly. Actually, we were busy with the studio software, but we, okay, we make progress all the time, so. Did you like the uh, way I had the three planes up there in the picture? 
Yes, so I think that's pretty important to understand kind of the interdependency between kind of the where the motion comes from and the consequences for your part. Because yeah. we, if we teach from causes to consequences, we want to know where the problem comes from. And yeah. if we talk about the motion, we certainly know that this results at a certain position at impact. And if we want to stabilize it to be consistent, we need to talk about this kind of wider or how did you say kind of the, the larger concept, which is the big, big picture. In, the big in, picture. Out, I like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when I'm out, the, when I'm out on the, out on the putting green and I'm watching the putter move, I'm seeing how it would move if it were going 360 degrees. I'd write that down if I were people. <laughs> I'd sit there and watch how the putter is moving, how the shaft is moving, how the sweet spot's moving, how the club is rotating in space as if it were a big eight foot wheel, eight foot diameter wheel, right? And is it to the right or to the left of the hole? Or you see what I'm saying? And then I'm looking for any twisting of the, the relative rotation of the, of the radius, is it twisting? Then are the arms, so it's like I'm working from the big picture through the club, through the hand, the uh, wrist, the forearms, I'm wor working the chain of command from the club all the way down to the feet. So the feet are, are I know you did a presentation on the feet. They have an indirect influence on the club, as we saw, right? But it's the, in the chain of command. The this is the generals and the and the sure. the commanders, and you know what I mean. And the, down there is the 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 feet are like the, the enlisted men, the grunts. They're the ones that got to hold us stable to the ground, you know. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I look at the big picture when I'm putting. Or watching or giving a lesson of what the club's doing and what the hands, the arms, and body are doing. Um, what's interesting is then we used to have an eye test in my flat stick certification, is you had to write down on a, a form what you thought the face was at address, what the face was at impact, the path direction, the path arc. And then you had to write that down before you got on the SAM to see how close you were with your eye test. You know, so that's a great act activity for you guys out there using Sam Putt Lab. Feel free to use it. Write down what you think the numbers are going to be when you're outdoors before you measure. Now, don't let them see it, but see how close you are. You know what I mean? And that's a way of training your eyes, training your brain. You had said to me two years ago when we presented at the uh, Putt Conference in Berlin, two years ago. Yeah, two or three years ago. Yes, you're right. That 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 you had explained to me that that my eye was so trained because my brain knew what to expect to see, and that's how I could see it. Because otherwise, the human eye couldn't see it. But you had explained to me that I had that's seen true. so many patterns in my brain, 3D, with the body, with the club, that I was expecting to see this, and then oh, I did pick up on it. You see what I'm saying? So that I think as a coach is important to continue training your eye of what to look for uh, in a putting stroke. That, that was a lot I learned. Do you know what else I learned from that conference from you? Remember when you had the big uh, easel with the white paper and you went, you were talking about some people are just so far up here in the far left corner, like in this small little, and that you have to you have to pull them. You have to, they have to experience. You have to pull them back toward the middle just to get them to change. Could you kind of re talk about that again? Because I thought that was in my thirty years of teaching, that was pretty monumental. Well, well that's maybe another topic for another conference. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, so maybe just shortly, what you what you refer to is kind of these brain maps. And our behavior is kind of, yeah, we think behavior is somewhere, but it basically it's in the brain and it's stored in maps. And now what we are is kind of a simulation, which is stabilized to a way that it becomes our habit. And the habit is only part of the map. And this habit becomes stronger and stronger. So there is a big bubble inside of this map where our habit is and around there is kind of desert. Now, if you want to move this habit to another spot, you need to start to open the map again to get out of your comfort zone. And so you need to move into other parts of your map. And, and we are not used to do that. Children are used to do that because the brain is not that 
strictly structured, but we try to keep the habit consistent and constant because this ensures in daily life that we have a st stable personality. Let's put it like that. So not to, me, but everybody else, yes. <laughs> not you. Your map is just always fluctuating oh. a lot. But, yeah. but if you want to learn, you need to go through the map and you need to go across. If you are not able to come across inside of your map, you fall back. And this is yeah, this where transfer. the differential learning. Yeah, the, yeah, the yes. differential learning comes in. Yeah. Yes. So um, the transfer means that after the coaching, you have you are able to access other parts of your maps. If you mm -hmm. if you just did something and it there was no it was not lasting, so the next day you're back into your habit bubble. But if you are able then to go across in your map to another spot, you learned to adapt differently. So you changed your behavior. And, and this is something which um, is not really understood completely, but actually this is plasticity. So we are able to, to move around in the map, but we need to open up for our sensory input. And, and so because we are filtering, we need to draw down the filtering to allow input to the system. And then it starts relearning. Even very old people we know now at the age of 90, they can still learn a lot yeah. if they just lower the barrier inside of their filtering system. And this is what has long been overseen. And that's critical for our teaching coaching, certainly to understand yeah, so map we, concepts. We will do a conference on this subject. Yeah. And so, how, to, how yeah. to change your putting stroke, right? How to change your putting stroke, like how to do it. Actually, yes. So yeah, um, that would be a good, good topic. We got a couple more questions, I think. Um, so you prefer the grip to go up the lifeline? No, I do not. There's other creases in the hand that the shaft can be in. Uh, for instance, the shape of your, your palm and the length of your fingers. Uh, I personally cannot hold the club in my lifeline, but I can hold it in my fate line. So if you take your hand and do this, there's many different creases that you can put the shaft. And this is why grip shape and grip size are crucial in doing this. Uh, Tim was asking about, do I prefer it in the lifeline like Stan Utley? And uh, what's interesting is, you know, here's lifeline here and then fate line I think is there. But there's, for me, there's a much deeper crease. So uh, I know Faxon likes to have it more in this crease here. So there's different creases in your hand that, the, that you prefer to put it in, obviously. Uh, let's see, I feel it allows the potter to have a slight rotation that I prefer to see in a, a stroke. Yeah, well, the rotation is not coming from that, okay? It, it can be from, like we said with Tiger, shaft across the angle, uh, the, the palm this way. But if you put it in the lifeline, now the axle, so the shaft splitting the radius in the ulna, the ulna, and it actually slows down rotation. As you start to put the shaft axis toward the ulna, now the radius can rotate uh, over top of the ulna and you're gonna get some relative rotation. So there's a lot of people just don't really understand these angles. Um, let's see, do I have profound round grip? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, it, I would only give a round grip to somebody that likes to change their orientation of their hands, which I've already talked about, which I think can be a disaster. Uh, I don't mean to say this in any disrespectful way, but Paul Runyon's grip of having the palms turn this way and that way just creates a, a, it reduces rotation, but it also creates a lot of out of plane movement, specifically in the, the wrist. You're just inviting, the more you turn your hands this way or this way, you're just inviting uh, compound, write that down, compound wrist sequences. Yeah, so it's, uh, we've got, hey, we're starting to get some more questions. There's, there's still people <laughs> out there. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, we got a chat. Somebody says I'm coming to that conference. It's Charles. So whatever conference we have on how to change somebody's the maps. putting stroke, the maps. Yeah, we need to do that. We need to do it how it relates to putting for sure. And then other people can use it for full swing. But we definitely need to talk about that because, like I said, when we were at putt conference and you went over that, I mean, that was just that was just groundbreaking. That was like a huge epiphany that went off for me and it really kind of it changed 
well, I was already starting to move in that direction anyway of differential learning with the coaching, but it really like, it was almost like you giving me a blessing to go that way, just continue on that path of variable learning and, and opening up people's brain maps and creating new patterns. And then, then me understanding one very important thing is that, and I say this, we can't really change, but we can learn something new. It's not like the old pattern's gone. It's still in the brain. And under stressful environments, sometimes we revert back to the old pattern. Um, I remember a uh, ski instructor online giving uh, an example saying that if our old brain had, had a cable that was this wide, it could just efficiently go through that cable. And the new one is about this wide. And then as we use the new one, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as we neglect the old one, it gets smaller, smaller, and smaller. And I'm like, that's what we're doing when we're changing and learning a new pattern. We're not, this is not gone. Stressful situation, it might try to get through there and it's, it's, it's run into a block. So now we're, we feel blocked. And I think that's a very important thing maybe we could also talk about is how the brain blocks and interrupts, interferes with old versus new. That would be cool with that conference, wouldn't it? Okay, we will keep that thought. We need to maybe write that down so we don't we don't forget it. I write it down straight away. Okay, so David, this was just fun to me. I hope the others also liked it. I got so much out of it, and every time we talk, there's so much information. So, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. And so we will uh, be very proud to um, work more on this concept um, and uh, you will also provide your input on, on these aspects. Um, so very much appreciate your, your help on that. Yeah. Well, so, Christian, you know, I think we learn from each other because like I said, we're all gifted in our own way. And we, when we, <laughs> when we're open, when we're open to share each other's insights, right. And bounce back and forth, you know what I mean? That's where growth takes place. It's the guys that are closed-minded that think, think that they know it all. I don't know it all. I mean, I, I call you or I call Phil Kenyon or whoever, Dr. Rob Neal, what, you know, to, to bounce these ideas off because I know I'm crazy. I mean, I got, I'm on medication, so I've got to make sure that my thoughts that, I'm, that, 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 are, that are good thoughts. But, yeah, I've learned so much from you. Uh, thank you for Sam Putlab, 17-year-old Sam Putlab. We're going to have an 18th-year-old birthday, hopefully. Yeah, we will have a big party next year. We'll a, yeah, that would be a good theme, wouldn't it? We'll all have a party. Hopefully, it won't be online. It'll be in person maybe someday. Hopefully, yes. Yeah, and I look forward to coming to Ski of the Alps with you.